I was in Bradenton. I got in yesterday. Last, yeah. I went in, I left yesterday, came back last night. Used to be here with you, Jack. Damn, I, from I, Florida. I, I could have I been at a uh, concert tonight. They said, no, I got a ticket for you. I'm like, no, I got to be in, in Pittsburgh for a podcast. You and did all that for me? Yeah, yeah. Now I feel bad. Yeah, you shoot for you. You yeah. <laughs> said you shoot for me. Yeah. <laughs> I got you, I got you. You are now tuning in to The Relentless Project. Stories, real life. I appreciate you for jumping on the Relentless Project. For those of you who don't know, this is Roberto Clemente Jr., uh, son of the great one, son of Roberto Clemente Sr. I call him Mr. 3000. He was the first Hispanic, correct me if I'm wrong, to hit the 3000 mark. So, um, a lot of big accolades. Uh, you you kind of did a little bit of MLB yourself. You got you, you joined the MLB, and then you kind of went into the broadcasting side of things. And I'd like to dig into a little bit of that. But uh, you also you broadcasted during what, in my opinion, after the 1924 Yankees team, the best baseball team to ever exist, and that's the 1998 Yankees. People are going to be pissed when they hear that. But it's true. I think it's true. I think the 98 Yankees. I, I am biased. Also, one of the I best agree. franchises to ever exist in <clears throat> yeah, any sport. Yeah. Um, and you had the pleasure of like commentating during that. So, um, oh, I know you want to dig into that. I'm oh, sure. Oh, dude, I, I I don't want my nerd to come out in baseball, <laughs> but oh, uh, I'd like to talk about that. But um, <clears throat> I guess let's start it up. Let's start off with like, uh, what was it like growing up? You know, as a child under your your father's light. You know, because I think there's a lot of pressures that kids get put on um, when you have a, 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 a father, a mother, or a legacy to, to uphold. Usually it's like in corporate world or like for in policing, for example, or military. If your family is a family of policing and military, the kids are kind of put on that pressure of like, do I follow in those footsteps and how do I uphold those morals and, and, and stuff like that? How was it for you? Um, Growing up under that light of, of uh, <clears throat> not just a baseball player, but the legend of Roberto Clemente. I mean, where do you want me to start? I mean, I can. I have. <clears throat> I have two. Two storylines when it comes to my childhood. Obviously, before <clears throat> losing dad and um, my life after, and uh, the, my life before uh, the accident was amazing. Um, wow. I mean, I, I'm very blessed that, uh, you know, I had those moments, those years with him. Um, he was amazing. Uh, I, did I know at the time that my dad was someone that was impacting the world? No, he was dead. I was actually t imitating you know, other guys in the team when I was trying to do something at uh. home. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because daddy's over his dad, you know, he's just dad. Um, and Richie, I, I love like Richie Hebner. He had this thing he would do like this. And uh, so he would start laughing because I would be imitating his teammates, that. right? Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he was a, a gentle giant um, in, in many respects. And, and I remember being with him I'm um, in a car. I would be with him in the wintertime. Uh, and he would go somewhere, and I would jump in a car, and he would take off. And I remember him sometimes just stopping in a, a few kids playing in a in a, a park, a field. He would just go park the car and jump out of the car and start playing with the kids. Um, and all of a sudden, you have a bunch of people just showing up, and they, I mean, like a whole crowd just, you know, then after he took off, but he would play, take, have the time, take the time. Um, to touch uh, everyone out there. Um, so uh, it was great to watch. But obviously after, uh, you know, the accident, uh, uh, understanding, um, you know, that I would never see him again, uh, that, was, uh, that was pretty tough um, for me because I, you know, the day of the accident, I told him not to get on the plane. Uh, so I had a, a feeling of guilt 
that I did not do enough to stop him from getting on that plane. Um, so when you're seven years old and you have this feeling of guilt that you actually didn't do much to save your father from dying, um, that's a lot. Yeah, that, that, that's way, that way, that's a lot of weight on someone's shoulders. Um, and uh, it's interesting because like I, I grew up learning about your father through like stories of my family, right? Like everyone, if you're Puerto Rican, you, you it's almost like you were a, a, an extension of Roberto Sr. because of the stories and, and things he's done, you know? And then we learn about him in school and it's like, man, everything they tell us in school, like how he was as a per, like I've heard it from people. So it's almost like, wow, like that, that's, that's crazy. That <coughs> what Confer you see confirmation. On, yeah, Confirma yeah, confirmation. Confirmation. Right. What you see, what you see on TV, it's not always what, what's in real life, but like a lot of his story was like, for example, um, a lot of people don't realize that the reason he got on that plane was because every time he sent stuff over, it was seized by corrupt governments. So he put himself on the line in the sense of like, I'm going to get on this plane because I know the government is going to let me through with these. He, he was going to go and, and, and fight. Yeah. Uh, he was going to duke it out with whomever was in charge of the militia line there at the airport. He was a people's person. Right. Like, he, he was a people's person. And uh, that's a lot of weight to, to hold on to. How, 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 how do you manage that? How did you manage that at seven years old? You know, like <clears throat> you have, you have the world and then the world's taken. Well, I mean, obviously he was uh, my life and um, everything he did, I, I, I imitated. Uh, but, you know, from that day on, uh, my whole life changed, obviously. But, um, you know, that was the first traumatic uh, experience. But, you know, my protector was gone and now I fall in the hands of, you know, some bad people. Um, that three weeks later after that happening, um, I became a survivor of sexual abuse. Oh, so wow. I have, I have two strikes as a seven year old, um, to completely disrupt who I was as a child. Damn. And cause I see you today and like. You're, 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 you're an awesome person. You're outgoing. You're, you're really great with your kids. You're really great with people. Like when we were at the statue for your father's 50th anniversary, like people are coming up to you. And, and it, I know, I don't know personally, but like when a lot of people come up to me at like a party or something and like, it's cool. Like, I, and then after a point I get to a point where I'm like, okay, like leave me alone. That's never been you. You're, you embrace everybody that comes in. Like how, I don't even know how to. For how how do you how do you manage all those emotions to be able to like still see good in people? <clears throat> um, I I truly believe that the the peace um, in my life that has kept me going has been the feeling when I help someone. That in itself has saved my life. Um, and I can tell you that, you know, that's what drove me uh, in the darkest times of my life was able, I was able to help people and that took me away from myself. And that's been me all my life, helping people. That's, that's I mean, that's the thing that for me is, is what I'm here to do. But personally, um, aside from that, is 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 the is that piece really that that actually kept me going when when that was my darkest time of my life? I I I believe that wholeheartedly, personally as well. Like, I never get a better feeling than when I'm helping someone. And like a lot of people look at me like I get hosed a lot. You know, I I get the <coughs> as people oh, say yeah. the short end of the right. stick, right? But I, I don't I don't see it that way. You know, like. I'm who I am. I, I enjoy helping people. I, like, I love it. It's a passion of mine. Uh, this podcast is one of the main reasons for it is to up, like, uplift people's story, like help people get on the light. I have, I have MMA fighters coming on who are making their pro debuts and like 
you know, they're like, Hey, how much would it be to, to, to be on your show or, or to, to, for you to, to right. shout Promote me out? me, right. None, yeah. dude. Like yeah. jump Listen, on, yeah. talk, tell yeah. me your story. If it's, if it's good. We'll that's, share that's, it. That's like, exactly. No, that, listen, that is exactly uh, why I think you and I connected uh, from the very beginning because I, you have a great heart. And, and you know, I'm like, wow, this, this is a cool dude right here, you know? And, I'm all right. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I get it. it it's, uh, it's something that uh, it's, a, it's a natural, um, organic uh, love act that it's it's uh, it's a drug it's a, it's the best drug in the world it is and like it, it, it's i truly i truly love helping people and and i got that from you and i'm like wow this dude like you could have easily looked at me and be like ah oh, dude beat it beat it nerd like but like you, you brought me in you're like we're always cool we always have great conversations and i see a lot of the stuff you do a lot of your time is allocated to like what you can do for someone else or like philanthropy and stuff which we'll, we'll get into stuff uh, we'll get into that but like a lot of your time is dedicated to what you're doing for other people and I, like I admire that I really do and people like what is what people think we'll talk about success and stuff like that but like what is success success to me is like helping others and like I mentioned earlier I get hosed a lot right and people are always tell me why, why are you do that oh, if this is how they're gonna be or this. I'm like it's not about how people react to what I do it's about what I'm doing for people and if this person takes takes advantages of and and I get hosed, right. that's on them. Like that's their bad. That's 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 their loss. That's not going to change or affect what I do or how I approach the next person. Right. You know, and it's I'm not perfect. Like there's days where, you know, I may not go the whole way with someone or for someone, and and there's days where I may drop the ball. But it's like nobody's perfect. Hey, we're human, and we're human. Yeah, people forget that. People see especially for someone like you, right? Like you're under your father's light and they see you and they're like, Oh man, like you, it's like, dude, we all experience pain, drama, trauma, like that. What happened to you at seven years old, bro, I've known you for years and this is, you just dropped that on me. I had no idea. Bro, I know. I mean, uh, you know, <clears throat> I, I, I thought we were going to get deep, but damn, yeah, we're getting listen, deep. Like, I, 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 like that's something I never even considered. Well, you know, I, I, I believe that I, I, I have a responsibility um, right now. And I, once I made the decision that I, I have to be vocal. Um, and I think I have deeper reasons, I think for myself, uh, therapy, it's something that the more you talk about it, the better you're going to feel about it. Um, but also being able to show people, mostly men that have gone through the same thing, that they're not alone. Uh, they need to understand that you have to deal with it. You have to face it. You have to uh, really get to a point where you have to face it face to face. There's so much strength in that. And and sexual abuse is always the one we want to like. Oh, I can't but, talk yeah, about no, that. No, mostly but, when you're you know, a man. Man, I mean, it's and, like, and I, yes. We'll be, talk about. Right. We'll talk about or alcoholic abuse, drug abuse. We'll talk about, you know, we're even comfortable with talking about our, our, our vices and stuff. But once it comes to like that sexual abuse, guys like put it away, you know? And like, I have, I have some family members out of respect for them. I won't, I won't bring, I won't mention them, but as an adult, I learned growing up with these people, we played every day. We were close. We were cool. And then there was a point in my life where I realized like they were just going down a, a, a dark path and I never understood why, you know, I grew up thinking like, Oh, I just made better decisions, you know, like, or I got lucky or I was blessed or I, I was favored or, and then as an adult, I realized like th they, you know, we've had heart to hearts and stuff. And then they, they disclose sexual abuse. And I'm like, I, what? Like that explains a lot. And they never dealt with it. They never talked about it. They never like hit it head on. And most problems, if you approach them head on, like that's when you start to learn a lot about yourself. You start to learn about, and you start to realize like, I'm, this isn't going to have power over me. Like I, I'm going to own this. Like it happened to me. That's a chapter of my life. We sealed it. It's good. It's done. <clears throat> yeah. You have. Yeah. I, I get, yeah. And, and the thing is, I, I remember there was a time that I, I would say that I feel victim at that point but no longer said I became a survivor um, at that point. 
uh, that changes a lot, uh, how you start dealing with it and, and, and really being vocal about it and, and actually not falling to the other side of, of the coin. So your first step would be, what was your first step during that? Is, is, is When I mean first step, I don't mean like what happened immediately, but like when you started to deal with it, was it acknowledging it and approaching it head on? Like was that... It, listen, it, t- it takes so many years yeah. to get, it, it, it is, I mean, number one, it, it's not that you happen one time, it happened for years. Um, so it was not just a, a one-time thing, it was actually, actually it, it was years I grew up with the situation going on. So, but, you know, I, I went out and played sports and, and, and so forth, but, you know, that's why I, des- I decided to be able to tell my story, because uh, people know that story. Uh, they don't know what happened to me after that day, and my 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 nightmare started three weeks later. Um, my journey that is, uh, I say, I, I in my story, I can easily come up with eight to ten movies with just sim- uh, certain situations that happened in my life, eras. I have different eras. I mean, which is <laughs> I, oh, I, my life is eras. Yeah. yeah, my life is eras. <laughs> That's and, a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah, I, I have eras. Yeah, eras. Yeah. Yeah. eras. Right. Oh, uh, dude, I was. <laughs> we're not gonna mention some of the some of the stories we've talked about. Where I'm like, dude, that's fucking wild. Yeah. Like, yeah. But that that's true. Yeah, eras. Let's yeah. get let's get into let's get into the era of like you moving because you you grew up. Your, your father pushed you to Puerto Rico to be born in Puerto uh, Rico. Yeah, right? ma- mom you had, had to be born mom, in Puerto yeah, Rico. Ma- mom had no choice. Mom was actually about to pop, and you go in a, you got pop in Puerto Rico. You're going back, so she had to fly <laughs> um, back, uh, and and uh, all three of us had to be born in Puerto Rico, and, and that's what she did, uh, to the point that uh, Ramiro Martinez, uh, who was a, a great reporter uh, for many years, followed that you know for many many years. Um, went to the hospital because at that point you, as a player, you cannot leave for you know ma- you know your maternity leave like they do now, right? You, you had couldn't to play. leave. You, no, no, you you play. You don't. You having a boy. You you having a kid. You you're not going anywhere. You you playing. Wait till the season's over. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, that's that's the way <laughs> that's it was. Crazy. But then but then again, if, if all the normal players, they will have their wives there in the same city where they're playing and have the kid there. But well, no, dad, dad was proud. No, see, dad was so proud to know you go to Puerto Rico uh, while I'm playing ball, but you're gonna go to Puerto Rico and have my son, my kids in Puerto Rico. Um, so Ramiro, what he did was actually he went and recorded when I was born in the in the room my first cry. So he recorded my first cry to be able to go after the game and play for my father on the phone. And people don't realize this ain't like it's not like iPhone where you record it, send it. Like no, no, this was actually a like tape a re- recorder, a microphone attached to a. Well, the cassette decks that with them, and then he's there with, waiting for me to. Here you go, you know. Yeah, it's crazy. Just to fly it all the way out here so you, your dad can hear it. Yeah, that's crazy. So like you had to like bounce. So essentially, you, the family had to bounce from Puerto Rico to Pittsburgh, Puerto Rico to Pittsburgh. Well, I was, but well, mom and I were in a plane uh, six weeks after I was born, which uh, is not recommended in today's I, I don't today's know. medical. I don't times. know what the, what was going on, but I was on a plane uh, uh, here, Pittsburgh. So, so I was so, here. So did you guys have like two, like you had home in Puerto Rico, and then like home here? Or was no, this like so always like a, 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 a rental. Uh, he would, yeah. So. Uh, because dad would leave Puerto Rico right after uh, winter ball, right? And then go to spring training, then get to Pittsburgh and here he would rent uh, an apartment for the season. Um, he would bring his cars, he would ship the cars from Puerto Rico up here. Um, Puerto Rican, gotta have the cars. Yeah, yeah, you know, so he would ship them back and forth, right? Um, but uh, he would get his cars and, and uh, rent. You know, we, we would come, you know, up for for the season and, and and until school started then we would go back to puerto rico so we had to go back to school so we would be here only for the summer so we would be here summertime and back to school in puerto rico well that's a lot of traveling that's a lot but i mean i guess it was normal it, it was it, it was, that was what yeah it was. i would say yeah. that's your normal right then. like you know like there's kids who grow up who don't go to like a brick and mortar school they do online schooling because their families are always traveling and 
So I guess if that's all you know, that's all you know. It makes it for an exciting time. Yeah, it, it was exciting. How did you? Uh, how did you dive in? What, what was your dive into sports? Because it wasn't just baseball. Like you played ball. You, I, I read you were like, oh, don't talk uh, about volleyball because that's ooh, like listen, volleyball I, star. Yeah. Uh, it, it's fun. I mean, listen, I, I, the people that don't understand or haven't played like volleyball, like com- a competitive volleyball. Um, the adrenaline, the, I mean, the action, Dude, it's, it's action tough. packed. It's actually, it's unbelievable. I was the captain of my team in, in, in school, uh, in high school in, in Puerto Rico. We have a professional, a, a professional, yeah. you know, which is a big sport in Puerto Rico. So, um, yeah, I love, I love volleyball. I'm pretty mean at the beach in volleyball. Oh, that's but like, you gotta be in shape too. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I'm, I'm a shape. I'm a shape. <laughs> but I, I, I'm not. I'm not the most athletic, and I'm five seven, so they never put me in the front. Like, and then when I'm in the front, people are like, "Oh, damn, Ish is up front." But I got hops, so like, I, I, I make do. No, I no, I hear it. So, um, uh, from volleyball to what? What else? What else? Basketball. I played. I played. I, I played basketball. Uh, I played hoops. Uh, Did you play volleyball, for high, high school? Puerto Rico no, I, I, actually, high I was. I was offered to become a professional basketball player in Puerto Rico. And I declined it um, because I wanted to play baseball. So you had the... You, yeah, I, I declined to play. I, 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 I said, oh, come on, you want to play? I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm, I'm just going to... So when you declined them, were you like on track to make no, it in baseball? No, I, or you I, were just oh, like, no. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I, I'm diving into baseball? No, I, I, I had decided that I was going to go to Manatee. Okay, uh, Larry Walker, who managed that, he was in uh, Panama City. Uh, he was uh, the manager there at the college, and, and uh, he didn't have any, any spots. He said he wanted me to go, to, to go and, and, and play for him. And he said, you should go to Manatee. They have a great program. Go there for a couple of years, and then you come transfer here. And that's what I did. I went to Manatee Junior College in, in Bradenton, Florida. I, I was... I was staying in Pirate. I lived in Pirate City. Uh, talk about ironic, huh? But I told the story yesterday when I was there that I was the first and last, the only person that stayed in my father's room because after he passed, no one stayed in that room in Pirate City. So when I went to college, that's where I lived, in his room. Dude, that's sick. How, like, how was, was it, it's gotta be surreal to be like, this is, this is where, this was his room. Is it still there? No, they, they, they did a, they, no, it, it's no longer there, but I, it's amazing to be there yesterday. Um, and those memories coming back, uh, it was pretty cool. But, but to finish the story, so what happened was that at age 14, there was a scout, Luis Peraza. And at age 14, he, he sent a report to the Philadelphia Phillies. I was catching a doubleheader. Our catcher was sick one, one, one weekend. And he, was, he happens to be at, at this field, and he was watching the game. And after the first game, he comes to me. He goes, hey, kid, how old is I? I'm 14. Oh, 14. He says, can I get some, some data on you? I say, yeah, sure. So I give him the data. Da, da. What's your name? I gave him my name. He goes, what? Are you? A, I say, yeah. Okay. Are you a catcher? I say, no, I'm just catching because I'm catching sick. You know, I was like, man, you're a great catcher. I say, yeah, well, this time my position. What do you play? I said, play outfield player. Then. So I said, okay. So he started following me. Um, and, uh, you know, then I took off. I went to Manatee and, and I, I get home for, for a break and I bump into Luis. He goes, hey, how are you doing? What are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm playing uh, in the Pacers over at Manatee Junior College. Um, he goes, uh, you ready for a tryout? Say when? Say yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, sure. So we Get went to the, the field. Fuck out yeah, here. just like that. Just like that. And well, I'll, be, I'd, I'd be I'll be dripping listen. sweat. I'm like, try I, it tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah, let's go. I said, let's go. So we went, and he worked me out. He says, hold on. He went home. He called the the GM, and said, we we got a prospect. How old were you at this time? I was 18. So like fucking fresh Bambi legs. I, 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 I just literally just went to Manatee, just got started. We hadn't even started the season. 
I was in break. I went to break for, for a few days. And, and this happened. This guy says, no, you're, are you ready? Let's go. And they offered me a, a, a contract. And they, the guy flew to Puerto Rico. And I remember I, I had a motorcycle at the time. And uh, I get home with my motorcycle. I just said, okay, we're going to sign you. You're going to get signed. And Luis goes, you need to get rid of your motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I say, yeah, no problem. Yeah, risk management. That's so, what they're doing. So he, so he goes, get rid of your motorcycle. Make sure. But we're going we're gonna, to come in with a GM. We're going to sign you. And yeah, we're going to have the contract ready. How fast was that motorcycle going? It, you know, <laughs> so I have some stories about that. But um, I get home. uh and he got home early, and I arrived with my motorcycle. They find me even before they sign. I signed my contract. I said, "I told you to get over the rear of the motorcycle." So I said, "We're gonna take some money out." I said, "No." At the time, they they want to find me because I, I I arrived to sign my contract in my house to my house in my motorcycle. Good, good, good. Anyway, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, so like baseball was always a part of the family, but like, did you? Were you playing like organized baseball before that, or like? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I you, you need to understand. Um, I played anytime all year round. I, we played baseball all year round. Uh, every league, every, our league was over. We were starting another one. So you know, when it came to baseball, um, that was, you know, I play. I used to play at, at the break. Uh, the, we used to have the whole school watch us play baseball, and, and there was a, a big section in our school. In our, in our, in our, in our, it's like a little in, indoor yard type of deal, and we would yeah, have full blown, almost. yeah, a courtyard, full blown like with with a paper or a tape ba- ball, and and a, that crazy, like no, it was pretty cool. That's it. Like you hear these stories, and you're like, wow, like you don't see that today. You don't see kids doing that anymore. No, I mean, you see the kids go. I want to play baseball. Play, listen, Give me the five hundred dollar mitt. Listen, mom had a, yeah, Christmas. Their Christmas decorations. You know those those at the time. You know today they they're breakable. They're like, but way back when they were foam in the inside and they had like uh, elo um, uh, thread right in different colors. Dude, my mom still has those. Yeah, no, so so it. we used to get the cut the things off and just to have the 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 foam ball. You play with ornaments. A, yeah, we we got. Oh, mom, we used to get. Oh, you you don't have no idea. I have no idea. We played with everything, anything the round and we played with baseballs that today people would cringe to understand that we were playing there inside the house just with all kinds of balls that we had no idea what we were playing with. You're talking about like, but yeah, like, like oh, silver bats. There was a silver, a, a silver bat. One of those has a dent because we used it inside to hit a ball. Imagine that. What year? Do you remember the oh, year? I can't silver? remember. That's the I, 1961 I, silver bat. Listen, I, I probably that's the, I, that might be the one, but <laughs> listen, we'll check for I the was, dent yeah. after the show. But <laughs> I, I can tell you that we. We had no clue what we were doing. We're kids. But yeah, the, wait, come on. That wait. goes to show you the, the the like the 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 beauty of like that like he such a big name, such a big person, but like the family unit was intact. It was like small, you know, like you were playing with a silver bat award baseball. Inside the house. To you it's yeah. like it's, I'm playing with, you know, dad's bat. Yeah. You know, like right. yeah, he got this whatever. Right. But like to the world you're like, oh, what? Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm sitting here thinking, like, you yeah. dink that bat, bro? Like, now it's in a showcase that for that, I mean, we were just talking earlier, Daddy Yankee's been in this room. Uh, oh. Your family's from Pittsburgh, you know, all kind. you know, the players come before the games. and The come. list is long, my friend. A yeah, lot of, like, the the impact, um, you know, the, the name, uh, what it represents. Uh, like, we had no clue. We had no idea. It was Dad. It's his dad. I mean, he left a rooms full of trophies and accolades and stuff. And you look around and people were going like, oh, my, this is amazing. Oh, and you're like, and we're like, what? This is, our, this is what we play pool. We shoot pool. There's a pool table right here. We're shooting pool. You know? And they're like, oh, you know, we, I got stories about those rooms. Uh, I mean, I, I shocked couple, a lot of people. A yeah. couple podcast episodes. Shocked a lot of people in there. Dude, that's wild. So you get signed. How's that for you? Like, that's got to be exciting. You're on the path of, like, what's your name, what's your it, destiny? You're in your was, destiny's yeah, path. Yeah, I, you know? listen, and talking about, talking about 
the trophy room. So I told myself, right, I would, I would have two, I would grab two items out of those trophy rooms and I will look at them. And I will tell myself, I'm going to go and earn my own World Series rings. I'm going to become a player. I'm going to go to a World Series. I'm going to win the World Series. And I'm going to have my own. It's big, big shoes to fill. All right. It's good goal. I, I'm, no, I'm, I'm going to go play and I'm going to go get my ring. Okay? That, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah? Yeah. That's what I'm doing. So I'm signing and I'm thinking, okay, yeah, at the start of my goal, I need to first, I'm going to sign a, a, a professional contract. Boom. Number one. Done. Done. Check. Let's go. One thing that I did not understand and did not realize when I signed that contract was that after I signed the contract, probably a couple of days later, I looked at myself in the mirror and did not understand what I just did because I had a lot of doubts. I had a lot of questions. I had a huge void. You need to understand that after the accident, my father had brothers. Those brothers disappeared. They never, they never stepped foot in my house ever again. I never saw them again. Okay? So I had some questions as a young man. But mostly I had questions for dad on the side of baseball because I didn't have him there growing up up to that point. I was very successful. I won batting title after batting title growing up in the league. Ruben Sierra and I were always battling for batting titles and he never beat me. So I could play. That's what I'm saying. So like... But you're, you're but, on the road there. Yeah, but it's not the just the physical ability, but baseball is a game of failure. You need to be ready to fail. You need to be you need to understand that baseball <laughs> you're gonna fail seven out of ten times. You fail seven out of ten times and you're you're an all star. like a metaphor for life it is like i know it, 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 exactly because i think you comfort and comfort and success don't don't live in the same field no if you're comfortable it's hard to gain success because you, there's no growth comfort and growth rather let me go with that mm-hmm. comfort and growth can't live in the same room because if you're growing you're going to be uncomfortable because failure comes. Um, you're breaking out of blocks. your shell. You, yeah. you break, you're breaking shells and, and layers, and, and you have to break through to be able to grow and get another T-shirt on, yeah. another, another, yeah, another, another yeah. armor to be able to fit in it, and then you break that one and get the next one on. Yeah, and people, it's hard for people to grasp that, you know, because they find failure, especially like, in, 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 in your instance, like you have big shoes to fill, right? The first moment you feel you didn't fill them or you, you're not living up to this standard that you've placed on yourself or like, it's easy to go, fuck this ain't, man, this ain't for me. Most, it happens to most people when you see that every time. And it, it's unfortunate because, especially for me, people get so annoyed with me because I see potential in people and things and I'm always trying to like, build them up. Let's go. Let's go. Like people will bring me an idea and I'm like, dude, you can, you can, you can take this far. Like, you're a motivator. You're, yeah. And, yes, I, yeah, and they're just push. like, yeah. I, I can't. And I'm like, oh, but you can. <clears throat> they're like, but this happens. So what? You know how many times my, I've shit the bed with this podcast and you'll never know. Cause I always just push through and right. find another way, you know, like, Wow, that was nice. That, 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 was, <laughs> that, 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 that was very timely. You're, you're, okay, yeah. preach it, preach, preach it. it, preach it, preach it. But, uh, yeah, like um, 
you'll never know. Some of my first episodes, you can't even find on YouTube because the camera stopped working or whatever. I could have easily been like, you know what? Like, even, perfect example. I had, I was supposed to have a guest, a guest yesterday. I drive like 50 minutes. I get all set up. And, you know, dude's not there. I text him like, hey, just so you know, like, front door's open. Just, just come on in. He responds with, hey, family emergency. Whatever. Can't make it. Old-ish would have been like, what the fuck, bro? This is bullshit. Da, da, da. New-ish is like, all right, cool. Packed up. I was like, I got, a, I got an extra practice and, and setting up. Now I know if I ever film in this area, mm-hmm. I know exactly where to do it, exactly how to do it. It's like, cool, whatever. Um, you know, I was like, I got Roberto tomorrow. Like, I'll push his episode up. Like, Yeah, but you didn't know I was in Brady's in the yesterday. I didn't, you would have had a heart attack, you easily, Dude, I'm glad you didn't tell me, bro. I, and I was going to text you last night to be like, hey, bro, we still... I'm glad I didn't. Because if you would have hit me with, I'm in Florida. Oh, I, yeah. I would have been like, he ain't coming. He ain't coming. No, hey, if you would have heard that was uh, the invite for the concert tonight, forget it. So, we, yeah, so you go. owe me. You owe let's me. Go. Oh, saying? yeah, I got yeah. you. I, I got you. So, yeah, growth and comfort, like you, you, but you need to also understand that who I signed with, I signed with the Philadelphia Phillies, my friend. I'm sorry to hear that. All right. No, I signed, <laughs> That's you. But people are asking me, why did you sign with the Phillies? Well, the arch rivals of the Pirates. The Pirates, yeah. I mean, they fight, like literally fights on the field. Like, you know, they wanted to kill each other. Um, there's a story behind that. It's because when I lived in Pirate City. Uh, I would come home to Pirate City from my practice or games, whatever, and, and I would go to the cages, which I was there yesterday, and I was telling the, the, the Bob Nutting the story that I will be hitting, uh, Travis, I was hitting at nighttime, late. So some players will hear, hear me hit, and they will go out and start enjoying me hitting. Now, the Branch Ricky, the third, who was in charge of player development at the time, uh, called me in one day. He goes, listen, you can't have my players playing, you know, hitting at nighttime, blah, 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 blah. I said, yeah, fine, but you handle your players because I'm not your player. You know, I'm not your property. No, you can't hit, blah, blah, blah. You know, so we had a little thing. I said. Altercation. Yeah, I just said, yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, anyway, so I actually ended up signing with the Philadelphia Phillies. Now, when I walk into that situation my first day, I was, I weighed 150 pounds and most of it was hair. <laughs> All right. Do you have long hair? Oh, I, just, I had a fro. What, what are you talking about? Yeah, I had a big fro. <laughs> I got to see these. Oh, so um, I, I walk in and I, now I'm meeting all the co- my coaches and, you know, everyone there. And I realized that all these guys that are there coaching played against my father. The majority played against my father. Tony Taylor, Roly DeArmas. I mean, everybody was there. I was like, wow, these guys were battling against my father. You know, so I'm now part of their team, their, their clan. It's kind of be weird. <laughs> you know what I mean? Dude, that's, <clears throat> that is weird. How do you walk into that? Like, did you walk into I, that like, listen, with a chip in your shoulder? I did not realize where, what I just did. Anyway, long story. <laughs> I, I walk in and... And I remember my first day, I was not expecting what happened. I never thought of it, right? So I'm getting ready, getting the uniform on, getting all fitted, getting, you know, getting everything, all the gear, everything's there. I look at my locker, I see Clement in the back. I said, wow, you know, I'm here, let's go, you know? So I don't know what to expect. Say, what's next? Why, what's going to happen now? So we go through the whole, we're going to physical tomorrow, and the, the whole, okay, cool. So now it's time to go out and stretch. And I'm about to I get my gear, I'm ready to go. And I'm about to run out the door for the first time to the complex. And they stop me. Clemente, hold on. Over here. Um, you need to take care of this over here. And it was a slew of reporters. Before you even walk out the, a slew. The doors. I mean, there was a bunch of them. A bunch. You and I'm now. I'm supposed to be stretching, but, but I, I, you know. So why am I talking? To, I'm alone talking to these people. 
And all they want to know is like, are you as good as your father? Oh my gosh. That's what they want to know. I'd be like, watch. You tell me. I, I, I was not, I never thought of anything like that. I, it was, I was always me. It was, I'm playing. That's not that. I'm, you know, I never thought that never came. It never even Registered. in my mind. It was never, no, I'm just a player. I'm going to go play. I never, never expect, or ne I never really thought of the comparison part of it. That if I go into the same sport as my father, I was going to be compared to my father. And my answer was, well, is there anyone in Major League Baseball right now as good as him? I, I said, I, I'm, you know, I'm 18. I'm, I'm you know, it's, I don't know. But now, from that point on, now I, I start thinking, I start getting into my head. I never did that before. Leave it up to the media to fucking ruin things, huh? Because that's so true. If you're not, if that's not in your radar, you're going out there putting your, you know, giving your all. Now you're like, man, if the media's thinking that, who else is You, you is have, you have this? no idea what that did to me. Um, I didn't say anything. But I drank that night, and I drank every night while in spring training. Didn't sleep. It took me into a completely just. I it just it 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 just it was a fee. It was it it was a very weird what it, what happened. The it, an implosion of my, my whole psyche, my whole thing. I'm standing there and I, I'm like, what am I doing here? Am I supposed to be here? Am I good enough to be here? Uh, so that, that flipped something in your mind. In my to, mind. To, to tether that comparison for good. I don't know. I mean, all I know is that there was no one to talk to about it. How, besides the drinking, how was that managed? Yeah, you have no one to talk, like, like no one came to you? There was no one like, hey, bro, like I, I, I don't understand your situation, but I'm here if you need, because like you see a lot of role, especially in, in, in sports, you see a lot of like people become fatherly figures and role models, role models and mentors, and like there was none of that happening at that time? No, no. Um <clears throat> It's, it's kind of weird because I think people expected that I had a lot of support. They had, I had people around me. Um, and we had no, I had no one. I actually, it, I grew up um, alone in, in, in many respects because my mother left everything intact when the accident happened, meaning the clothes were there for 30 years. The closet, everything was intact. <clears throat> she was always taking care of Luis and Ricky, right? I was more, you know, and I would just take off and with, with that and da da da. So she had kind of kept, and I, I kind of started flying around early 12 because uh, mom wanted me to speak f more for her because of the language and she felt that I would express better with the English and so forth. And I, she always said, you're, you know, you're, you're, you, you became go, the mouth for the family. I was, I was, I was the, the spokesperson, um, in many respects. So a lot of the flying around I did cause she didn't like to fly anyway. So at a young age, I'm going to all these dinners and I'm going to all these da 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 and I'm the one flying around, you know, doing adult stuff. And as a child, but, yeah. but the thing is that from the very beginning, even from day one, anyone that I met that knew who I was, their immediate reaction was they would start crying. They would tell them their, their stories. No one asked me how I was. Not one person, not one, not one person asked, how are you doing? 
but they had to tell me about their loss, their feelings, their pain. During everything, yeah. That's you know, and I'm consoling strangers. From your tragedy. From my tragedy. Yeah, tragedy, right. It goes to show you, like, you really never know what someone you should know, right? Like common sense would tell you something tragic happened to this kid. He lost his father role, is you know. But people get so hung up in their own shit. The first thing that comes out of their mouth is, <clears throat> and they think, and, and and I think, I don't think a lot of people have bad intentions. No, no, I think th- no. I think it's their way of like trying to connect with this you, like, oh, we we I, understand, and then I, they dive into that rabbit saying, hole. I don't blame any. I don't blame them at all because I understand. I get it. Like. To this day, it doesn't matter. It, it's been happening since day one. Yeah. It happened yesterday probably 200 times um, with 200 people that I met yesterday. Uh, anyone that I meet, it doesn't matter where I'm at. I, I'm wearing a jacket and they'll look at me. They're, oh, my God. And they, they have to tell their story where they were. Oh, I never saw my father cry ever. The only time I saw him cry was when that happened. You know how many times I've heard that? My father has never cried, not even for his wife or him, but he cried for my father, for your dad. That's crazy. That, that's how the impact of, of him being on this earth just, just did, did his thing. He came to do something, and he did it. That makes you think about, like, life a lot, you know, like... Like, what is our purpose? What is, like, you ever think of stuff like that? I know, I, I know you do, because I, 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 stupid question. This, I, listen, and I say it all the time, and, and, I, and for people that are, are out there right now that are in, in, a, in a job that they don't like, they're doing, it doesn't matter if you went to college for, to, and you don't need to stay in that lane. You need to find your passion because it should never be a job. It should be something you're passionate about, something that you, you train for. Yeah. And, and this is what you want to do. Do what you want to do. Do what you want to do and what you are good, good at and what you think that, you know, if you have something, find that passion because that's going to be able to help what you're doing today because you won't have a drive. You need to have a passion. Wake up in the morning and say, this is what I'm, ha- this, and you're, you're in the driver's seat because now you're, yes, let's go. But if you're waking up, dreading to wake up because you don't want to do, I, I don't want to, I can't, I don't, but don't do it. Find a way of getting out of that and find your vehicle, your passion, and drive it. Yeah, if you love what you do, you're never working a day in your life. That's the quote, right? Exactly. But it's so true, like, like, uh, especially in, in, we'll go in policing, right? Like, I've worked with some people, all I do is complain. Oh, the, the, the community doesn't understand, or, or the admin doesn't understand. Like, they hate their lives, they hate their jobs. And I'm like, why are you doing this? Like, you don't get paid enough. You can go collect a check somewhere. Like, why are you still here? And I have these conversations with people because if like, especially a, a, a position that impacts a lot of lives, and, and that's a little dramatic in the, in the police sense because you're, you're impacting lives. You have the ability to impact lives in a good way. But it's, it's done negatively a lot because of people who hate their life, people who hate this job, but they're still in it because, oh, I've been here for 10 years, 15 years, 20 Fucking leave. Do everyone a favor. Do yourself a favor. Like, you're going to work this job to the day you retire and then die. Because that's what happens, in, especially with, with cops. As soon as they retire, a couple of years down, they die. It's like, go do something you enjoy. Start all over. Who cares? Go play golf. Go play. Yeah. Do go do, you know, I mean, I'm getting, I mean no, find a passion. Find, Monetize it. Right. Monetize I mean, it. We're in the world of online businesses being created. Right. Like, why are you wasting your time on something you don't enjoy? I like, and I get it. You know, 
you have bills to pay. You have kids in school. Or, in like, the meantime, you can start. Listen, for example, oh, I don't have to, I don't have money to go to college or get trained or get get this free courses, free courses, Coursera. I've heard of that. Coursera has even Harvard. I mean, from Harvard to every college you can find, any course you can you can get it for free, free. You have no excuse to be able to go to college if you want to. If you want a degree, you have to pay for it. But if you don't need the degree, you just want education. You want the education and know the know how. You can get it for free, bro. If you have one of these for free. Exactly. Everything's free. YouTube, Google. Listen, when I first heard of Coursera, I said, no, wait a second. You mean to tell me that, and this is years ago, right? And I, and I, and I looked it up and I started looking at all the, the courses and all the colleges that are offering those free. I'm going to have to look at that. Free. You can become whatever you want from home okay get the education that you need you can apply for a job and you can actually say yeah i can do it because you 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 took the time to build that knowledge and go for it is there like trade stuff on there too like every there's electrician the, yeah, there's like, oh, every there's anything you anything that you need coursera has it this is not an official sponsor but look at that no I, it's <laughs> anybody listening that call me up <laughs> Yeah, he's giving courses too for for the five dollars, five dollars. So back to that point of uh, being alone, right? Like I feel that way sometimes being alone in a crowded room. Like I know a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people. A lot right. of people don't know me, and it's funny because like I'm always I tend to be the more outgoing person in the room. I like making people laugh and smile. Like that's always a passion of mine, man. Yeah, that's why we connected. Yeah, and like so, but like. I always take the time to try and get to know people and their their drive and what why they are how they are and that's never reciprocated and sometimes like which is okay you don't have to tell me your story but like it's funny because every time I go to somewhere I meet someone and they're like dude you're the fucking coolest person I'm just like I'm just no nah, dude like I just having a conversation with you people don't have conversations anymore you know and I'll be in rooms where like everyone knows me perfect example when I launched this podcast it took off like people, people like it and they're like messaging me and stuff. And I was interviewing a lot of the stout people, the MMA gym I go to and I go to a belt promotion and I go and you know, I got my little headphones in. I sit waiting for everyone to get acclimated and stuff. And there's this dude who's staring at me. I'm like, Hey, what's up, bro? He comes up to me. Hey, are, are you ish? Like, yeah. He goes, dude, I, I didn't know. I like, I thought everyone would be around you, surrounding you and stuff. I'm like, why? He's like, oh, because like the podcast and you have, every, you have, you've had like Brit on there, Mike on there, like all these people. And I'm like, I'm not that, I'm not that important, bro. Like I'm just, I'm just a normal dude talking to cool people. Like, but like he, in his mind, the perspective, yeah, the perspective, the perspective I'm like, yes, I'm like, yes. bro, I'm, I'm a fucking nobody. I make it very clear you know, to be like that. That is a very good example of, of my life. Yeah. Growing up, that's okay? what, so that's what I'm saying. Like very good example. I love people do Okay. So a, a little P a lot of people that have this image of what my life and how I am, uh, or how I'm, I'm supposed to be, how, how I act. You know, like I'm a spoiled brat because of my name. Uh, that's her, they're like, oh, oh, you grew up, man. What a lucky guy. You're so lucky. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, what that's a, crazy. You're, you are so lucky. My God, you're Roberto Clement. You know how, how lucky you are? People don't know my life. People have no clue. They want to be something that they have no clue what is to be. It's like, bro, I wouldn't wish situation. my life on nobody. <laughs> I, I know listen, uh, I'm still dealing with crap, you know, every day of my life uh, with, I mean, and not only, I mean, the name part of it. Okay. So people are, they listen to, they hear the name, right. And immediately, oh, you're the luckiest, but you know, dude, I lost my father at seven. I, I, I grew up in a one parent home. 
where my mother was even very busy with my two brothers and and carrying the torch for the sports city with a lot of meetings and blah 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 i actually was out there just crazy crazy okay um so all i can say is that you know we need to look at our own lives and 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 really in, uh, understand what we're here to do right and and a lot of people the social media they live through everybody's you know images i which, hate social media wait, bro, why why well, you want to compare you you the, the comparison part is that part that, that i don't understand i can't i don't i don't i like and most of it is crap it's bs it's everyone's highlight reel social media is everyone's highlight reel yeah, you, like in sports, you get the best, like right. you get the best of this player's like hits and his catches, and you look at him, and you're like, "Fuck, this dude's amazing!" And then you go watch him play in a game, and he's batting horribly, he's making mistakes, and you're like, "What the fuck?" You're like, no, this is how he plays. That video you saw was five year of mm -hmm. uh, five years of highlights in thirty seconds. This is him. Like people, listen, people, that's social listen, media. That's social media. It, it, it's, um, you know, Olympic athletes. They train all their lives for 10 seconds. That's, that's so crazy. That's true. Yeah. Like a sprint. Think of a, think of a sprinting they, athlete. They, 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 they train all their lives for 10 seconds. It's the biggest 10 seconds for them, though. Think of it like that. Exactly. But that's the price. That's the goal, right? So there's a goal. So it's the sacrifice. How, what are you willing to sacrifice for your passion, for your... What, what are you willing? Tell me, what is it that you want to do that is so powerful that you want to do so badly right so badly that you have no friends because you i mean you're training you know you're not going out you're not going to go be hanging out you're, you're training you're and for years and years and years those 10 seconds are what matter to you so you were there for those 10 seconds and then we dive down the realm of those 10 seconds are over. Now what? If you lose and you have expected and built up to win that race and you have all the plans in the world because you believe that you are winning that race and you don't win it and everything that you plan for is not there, what happens then? Yeah, I guess the road splits. Like, do you try again? Or do you go, I wasted all my... And, and you see that in athletes. I wasted all my life for this and I didn't even perform. And then that's it. Their story ends. No, but that's why reinvention. Um, you know, you reinvent you don't stop there. You need to reinvent yeah. yourself. Yeah. That's what I did myself. All my life, I had to reinvent because I, I've done so many things in my life. I'm glad you mentioned that because speaking of reinvention, you're going to win a World Series ring as a player. That doesn't happen because of injuries and stuff. That would have been an easy moment for you to quit. Well, fuck, I'm a failure. But then this reinvention happens. And you're like, if I can't get it as a player, I can't like I'm gonna segue. You you know, you when you find a wall, um doesn't mean that you can't climb over it or dig under it to get to the other side. If you had the right tools, you might be able to break it. Yeah. But there is a way, right? 
there was a way. So what happened with with your MLB career? And I, I, it was a lot of injuries and stuff. So my so so my when I signed, I spent a couple of years with Philadelphia. Uh, went to San Diego in '86. Spring training, I injured. Steve Garvey hit a line drive to left field. I slide. I injured my knee. Right. So for for since spring up until August, I was sh- shooting cortisone in my knee. When August came around, I couldn't walk. So I had to walk out. I said, Pat, so I told my manager, I was in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. I said, Pat, I, 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 I can't. They were trying to figure out what's going on. They couldn't find anything, and I could, just couldn't walk. I said, I'm not going to lose my leg. I got I to gotta walk. So I go to New York. And I get a sur- get surgery. The Jets surgeon just does my knee for the first time. I walk with a cane just about for a whole year. To the day I get the second surgery, J- uh, Jack Fela, the pirate doctor, did my second surgery, and I was I was great. Full circle, bro. Yeah, right. That's great. Yeah, yeah, right. I went to the Jets. I was going to New York. Then I come to Pittsburgh, and and, my, and and the guy for the for the Pirates did it, and and I was able to start recuperating and. Um, this is 87, 88, I went to, I trained. So it, it took a lot of training for, for me to get done. That's three, a lot of rehab. Three years, three years. And- so I did three years in, in, in surgeries, right? So I went to Venezuela uh, to play in, in summer, summer league to see if I was to get ready. I, I, I was not stopping. I, 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 t- I, t- I was putting my time, but I put my time three years. And in three years, I was able to get back. And I went to Caracas, and my first at bat, I trained her, and my first at bat hit a home run. I was, I'm, I'm, I'm running top a of on top of the world, I'm best shape of my life. So I come, we win the championship in, in Venezuela. I fly to Puerto Rico, and I remember that was actually exactly two weeks after Hugo, okay? Hurricane Hugo, that devastated El Junque. So I'm flying into Puerto Rico and I'm looking at the devastation. Um, I was like, wow. So I, I get home and, and um, see mom. And, you know, a couple of weeks later, I get a call for a tryout with um, San Francisco Giants. So they call me, listen, we're just an end, whatever. Then there was another scout for the Orioles. He says, no, no, no. I, he saw me at the trial. He says, let's go. He signs me to go to the Orioles. So after three years, I go back now with a different mindset, best shape of my life. I'm older. I'm wiser. I've, I've gone through. A, I mean, and you, you overcome this adversity. Oh, so like you're on. Yeah, you're I'm, on. I am. And I'm telling you, I am the best shape of my life. And so I go into this with a different attitude. Um, the last day of spring training, Frank Robinson comes to me. He's with managing the team. He says, Roberto, awesome uh, spring. You know, good job. We'll see what happens. You know, one more, one more game to go. So I go to dinner and I get back to the hotel. And remember vividly that I I turn on the TV is the Nutty Professor, but it was Jerry Lewis and the the original Nutty Professor, which is my favorite. And uh, I turn it off. Um, and I wake up the next morning ready to go to spring training, but I I can't, I have no legs. Like I have no legs. Like I have no feelings to my legs. No pain. Just no legs. So I reach for the phone next to me. I call the hotel lobby and have them call the trainer in his room, give him a key to come and go to my room because I can't walk. So he comes in, he said, what's going on? And I said, I have no legs. So I start touching, nothing, zero. No idea why, um, but it was, it was crazy. It was crazy because now I'm going like, I can't walk. But why can't I walk? So take me to the hospital and to figure out what's going on. They start, you know, nothing. 
So I'm there for three weeks. I'm, I'm there's no for three weeks. I have no no legs until I started feeling a tingling in my toe. Three weeks later, and hey, I feel something. I feel a toe. <laughs> that was amazing. That was amazing. I have feeling. I have feeling coming back, and it, it started coming back, and it came back. Yeah. Took a few days, but it, it came back with pain. And but they figured they had herniated two discs. They I, they bulged, um, cut off all the feelings to my, to my legs for for a minute. Uh, but they wanted to. Oh, we need. We're gonna open you up. We're gonna do surgery. And kind of say no, no, you're not touching me. Uh, but that was the end of my career. I couldn't. I couldn't play. That was done. Um, so. I, I got home and I was depressed. I, I, I was done. I was in my room for, I don't know how long. Um, I was in my room for a while. Um, in my back, the pain, but just the devastation of my goals going down the drain. Yeah. Yep. That's so that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, and I thank God for my, my, my good friend, Luis Rivera, Boroco, my compadre. He played for the Dodgers. He was a catcher. But he always got in trouble because he, he should have been a boxer more than a baseball player because he, he liked to hit people. <laughs> Big guy, he's like you, I mean, big muscle guy, <laughs> catcher. And even as a kid, I mean, even in, in kindergarten, they threw him out of school because he hit, he started, he hit every, I mean, he hit people all his <laughs> life. <laughs> you know that. Yo, bow. Yeah, but uh, he, he was a catcher. And, and he, when I got home, he would call me like every day. Like he would call, he would call the house. Hey, Roberto. I, I'm, I'm, I'm managing this team. I want you to come out to see them. I, I need some help. I said, I'm not going anywhere. No, he, need, he won't say help. Say, I want you to come see this. No. Come coach. You know? no. So one day after like two and a half, three weeks, whatever, he goes, um, listen, I need some help. I really need help. Can you come see this team and help me? Tell me what I need to do. I said, okay, fine, I will. So I get out of my house for the like, first time. After a while, so I kind of go check. It was a Tuesday. I remember it was a Tuesday night. Okay, so I go and I sit in the bleachers. Nobody in the bleachers. I'm watching them practice in this field. These are 16 to 18 year olds. He's managing American Legion. They sucked. <laughs> they were so bad. Oh, it's not where I envisioned that going. <laughs> they sucked. So I'm I'm watching this. So after the practice, he goes, "Hey, go and sit down and have a beer." You know, Luis. I go, oh, "Okay, I'll sit down." I sit down. He goes, "What do you think?" They suck. Is what I think. Yeah, that's why I've been calling you. But let's do something about this. I need your help. And he said, "Help again." And when I hear that word, it's, it's something. It's, it's my kryptonite. It's actually it's done. It's over. I need to get involved. I'm the same way. Why, is that? <laughs> dude? Seriously, <laughs> it's why my kryptonite, is that? bro. And I, to a fault. I mean, I, it, I, I to my detriment. Okay, to my own detriment. But I don't care because it's what I do. My wife hates me for it because she says, "What are you doing? Are you crazy? Why? Why are you giving all this time?" To, 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 because it's if who not, I am. If not me, then who? That's it's who how, I am. That's, that's how I look at it. Like I can't if change. If I'm not helping them, who? Who's I, I can't. I can't change. It's yeah. who I am. Period. So I said, okay, I'll be here Thursday. I get there Thursday afternoon. There's a basketball court next to the to the baseball field, and there, there's some kids there shooting, smoking cigarettes, talking to girls, music playing. My players for this for this team. Oh, oh no, no, the players for the team. I'm talking about the players are hanging out at the basketball court as I'm going. So they're hella distracted. So one of the guys sees me. He goes, "Hey, coach." He calls me coach. I'm like, number one, I'm not your coach. 
Okay, let's start right there. Okay, you got a two hate coach. No, no, I'm not your coach. Okay, I'm here to help you out. I'm not, I'm not managing this team. I'm not coaching the team. I'm here just to make sure that you guys get strained out. So he goes, well, just to let you know, you're our coach because Louis came here just now, dropped off the equipment bag, and said that the team is yours. He took off and left me with the team. So, I said, really? Okay. And I can tell you that that moment was my turning point to get me out of my bed, out of my own, the head out of my ass, okay, of my depression, of my, because it was, I was going to help these kids, all right? Now, forget about the pain, forget about all the work that I did to, to get to playing and and I forgot about all the sacrifices that I have made and and I have failed because I, I I couldn't walk now I now will become a manager for this team which I did man no choice I inherited a freaking team damn coach <laughs> but it changed my life it changed my life and 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 from that point on um you know, that's how everything evolved. I had to reinvent myself on the other side and became a broadcaster. Um, when the opportunity came, I was ready to go. And um, like you said, that team was a uh, unbelievable team. Um, but I was able to go into reinvent myself now, a broadcaster, um, did some good things in New York. How did you how did you end up with the Puerto Ricans team? Everyone, if you're Puerto Rican, you're a Yankees fan by default. You should be. Or, or pirates, right? Or remember, pirate, yeah. or you have to yeah. be pirates. Right. But 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 you know what? You know what's those two. You know what's very interesting is that all the years that I spend with the Yankees, every person, Latino or not, I mean, all the Jews. I mean, I, I, I the Jewish community is huge with Clemente. They love that. You you don't understand. We I'm a family. I'm, I wear my yarmulke. I, I you don't understand. I have a pallbearer for. I'm I'm the family. I'm family, right? You need to understand. Yankee fans, they all say the only non-Yankee on my wall is your father. <laughs> Every they, Billy Crystal, the you know, Billy Crystal, oh. The only, your best, your best, but those guys, the, the, like the only like non pinstripe guy that they have showing is my father. Bro, he set a tone for the league, for who you are as a person. Like the tone was set and he set it early. Like, and that's, that's something you can't mistake. And I think that's why he's on everyone's wall. Like, I, I, I forget, um, we were at dinner or something, and we posted a picture. It was something, it was like small, I didn't even think about it. Um, dude, my inbox was flooded with random people. Oh my gosh, and that thing that they do with you. Um, this lady told me, didn't follow me, anything. She, she went on a th huge rant about her father, who was in the Marines, and collected a bunch of pictures of, of your dad and this, like went on this whole thing. And I'm just like, Oh my God. Like you don't even know me. Floodgates open. My friend. Yeah. I was like, but it, to me, it's surreal because I grew up learning about him inspired by him or, you know, like I grew up with a bunch of Puerto Ricans, lower East side of Erie. And we, you know, we'd, we'd play on a grass field and we'd, like people yell Kobe like we were doing that with baseball you know or like if we made a good catch in the left field or right field or something didn't matter where you were in outfield like and now I'm sitting at lunch or dinner with you and then now I'm getting all these inboxes it has nothing to do with me I'm irrelevant to this equation and yet this person is like went into this like space remembering her father as a marine because what people a lot of people don't know is your father also was a Marine. Was Correct. A Marine. Correct. Um, so I'm just like, wow. Like it's, it's, it's surreal to me. It's surreal to me. And I can't imagine. I, I just I just can't imagine the level it is for you when you're getting all these or when you're out in public and stuff. And I'm sitting here. I'm like, I, I just posted a dinner, with, a picture with my friend, 
right? Like you're my friend. I picture, I pic- I posted a picture of my friend, and this is what I'm getting. I'm like, damn, that's crazy. I don't even know how to respond. I'm just like, yeah, I mean, yeah, people like the connection is is real. It's organic, and and it, it doesn't stop. It it opens all these emotions. Um, that people need to share. They have to share. Yeah, like they, uh, so my, they, they have to yeah, share. Yeah. So my point being, not a baseball player, not a anything. It was just an older lady, and her father was a marine. Correct. Connection. Yeah. Yeah. There's like, a, there, it's it, like it, that's how it is. That's that's all it is. That's how that's how it is. So all that. How did you land? How did you how did you land with the Yankees? So I'm in a meeting. I go to New York City, right? I go to New York City uh, for a week of meetings. And I remember I was going uh, back to, I was between Pittsburgh and D.C. at the time. And, um, and I remember that I had my last meeting. Um, my agent was with me. And this guy that we were meeting had the rights. I mean, he was doing a magazine with uh, the New York Daily News and, you know, this guy just had a lot of deals there. He was a promoter. He was a uh, Don King's partner. Uh, I was in boxing world and he had bank, ring magazine and blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> at the end of the day, we had, we had this, com- you know, meeting. And then at the end of the meeting, he's looking at me. He goes, you know, we, uh, we always come bring a third guy to talk about baseball in our broadcast booth with the Yankees, our Spanish broadcast. You're a good looking guy, got a great <laughs> name, and you know the you know the game. Why don't you become our our caller guy, official caller guy? Caller? Caller, 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 caller. <laughs> like, you know, you know, not colored, but <laughs> I'll stop because it yeah, both I know, call it's the same thing. <laughs> So, so I said, let me think, well, as I'm saying, let me think about it. I get a kick under the table. My agent kicks me, shuts me up. He says he's taking it. I said, I didn't even talk about how much I was going to get paid. How am I taking a job that I have no idea what the, what I'm supposed to be What's doing? What's the description? Right, yeah. Nothing. No, my agent said he's taking it. I said, well, well he later goes on the Yankees. Doesn't matter. Once you're in, in with the Yankees, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna be okay, right? So I guess that was Friday. I never went back back to D.C. Blah blah blah. On Tuesday, I was doing my first game. The next Tuesday. Now, Dude, how was that? Because were you so were you commentating or broadcasting? Are those two different? Well, no, they're so. Or are they similar? So okay, so so they want me to be the do the commentary do the color commentary after they play by play so you fill in on the on the details of the play the tech you know what, what whatever was happening so the the Beto Villa was the was well, the voice of the Yankees Armando Talavera was the color they, they both of them they didn't play baseball they were not baseball professional baseball players at all they were just media guys so they would bring in a third guy that played the game to cover other technical stuff of the game, right? So that's what I did. Now, the guy that was doing the play-by-play um, did not want me there uh, because for the first week or two, I probably said a few words because when it was time for me to jump in and say something color, he kept them free. He would not... You know, he was kind of jealous. And, get and no, but he, I, I get it. But so I complained. I said, listen, you know, I, this guy's doing my job. What am, you know, what am I doing? I'm not. OK, so I just stood there and I say a word. I say, I'm going to get paid. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say a word. I'm going to stay right here. Like that. <laughs> Easy money. <laughs> right away. So, so Beto started going like. And I, I stayed because I said, you know, if you want to play that game, I'm not playing that game, Jack. It's fine. You want to. You know why I'm here? I'm gonna st- uh, st- I'm gonna stick to it. El vacío. Oh, oh, okay. Este Roberto. Then he started. Then we started. We he, we we got acclimated. So we we started really doing well together, right? So he knew that I was not gonna play a game with him because he just thought he was. He's. I believe he was. Um, he was afraid that I was there to take his. 
replace him. To replace him, right? Okay. That because obviously you have a name and you know what I said, listen, so he we, we started but by the end of that year, the producers say, Well, I want Roberto to have half the game as the play by play guy. So they we split the the games because I was able to click to a point to at first I was very uncomfortable with it, but they by the by after the All Star game something clicked, and I started coming up you know with my own style of how I was seeing things, um, and because I'm a I mean I, in many ways I look I look at things and I I. I put names to different things and, and I name things. I see somebody, oh, you look like this guy. I'm always connecting something, right? So I started I started giving the the players nicknames. Uh-huh. Right? So and I, I but then I started the the producer of the show of the, the broadcast said, uh, well, we're gonna split because Roberto I want Roberto to do play by play as well, to at least they get connected with play by play. And I started doing play by play. Um and I, that's when I started, uh, you know, with my signature sayings and people, man, that's awesome. You know, okay, they really liked how I would bring them back to, instead of welcome back to Yankee Stadium, so welcome back to the Vatican of baseball. You know what I mean? Um, Yankee Stadium. Damn. And like, oh, man, this is awesome. Even Michael K was like, oh, man, can I use that? I said, yeah, go ahead. You know, I can take some of that, whatever. You know, but I started getting my own style. I started getting comfortable with it, and, and people really liked it. So I, I really found a new passion, and, and, and I never knew that I was going to be able to be, you know, on the other side uh, of the coin and become a reporter because now I have to go and ask these guys questions after the games in the locker room, and I got to get all these interviews before the games, and and after tough questions because there's some, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I, I started doing it and uh, I enjoyed the hell out of it. I mean, that was, and I grew into this, um, I guess, that new role of a broadcaster in my life. Um, an opportunity uh, came with uh, WFAN and I took it to become the first Latino ever to host a show. Weba. On the uh, on, on their uh, network, which was great. Uh, so there was a lot of firsts that I was able to do and open the doors, but I think the most important one was in 1998. Okay, uh, that team was amazing. Okay, I I have so many stories I'm about getting that. Excited, they're just like there, there so many so many great stories because uh, I mean, wow, it was a great year. Uh, but I remember my fr- 97 was my first year, so they had won in 96, right? I I'm sitting there between my two partners and I look and I see there was the ring ceremony day for the Yankees. They are getting for the, the, the war for the ninety six, right? So they get their rings that day. So I'm maybe in in third inning or so I see just two guys coming down the to the to where the counter in front where Michael Kay and John Sterling are broadcasting from and they're handing them the rings and I and I for the first time like oh snap they're getting rings that's awesome we're getting rings this guy's like getting rings sweet right that's fantastic and then nobody came and I was looking at this guy and say where are your rings oh we, we don't get rings I said what do you mean you oh, don't get rings oh they weren't getting rings no then. So my partners were not getting rings. And I said, why? I said, oh, because you're Latino. You don't count? No, we don't get rings. Yet. I said, I figured. (laughs) Oh, okay. I didn't say anything. So 97, freaking Sandy Lamar... To kill the party with a home run, and we we didn't make it that year. So, ninety eight, the team was every day that we were getting to the ballpark, we were winning the game before the game started. What did, what did we, the Yankees go one one forty eight and it was, fifth, it was forty something? Uh, yeah, listen, it was just, it was insane. Dude, they, their record was insane. That was under uh, Joe Joe Torre. 
Yeah. Dude, I had a poster. I had a poster with Martinez, Jeter, Posada, all the starting lineup. I, I can't remember exactly who they nah were. Knobloch. Listen, Knobloch, nah yeah. Listen, so nah, okay, so let me let me tell you. Let me let me let me I'll, I'll, let me give so 98 you the, happens. The 98 happens. The team, El Duque. So, so El Duque comes into in, into into play. It was a sto- funny story because, man, just so many. St- we need a lot more time. Oh yeah, I know, I know. That's, that's why that's why, that's why that's why we gotta do mine because I'll be able to go through story after story. So we're because- gonna plug this in real quick. He's actually launching a podcast. That's right. I don't even know if he has a name for it yet. No, you got I a don't. Name? That's no, all, that's all I, I'll think about it later. Yeah. Today. We can, we'll get it out. We'll get it out. He's launching a podcast, and we're going to do it here at the yeah. Clemente Museum. Well, why not? Like, best place to do it. Uh, or they, PNC Park. Man, but I don't think they'll give us that. Not here. <laughs> we'll do it here because we have a lot more fun doing it here. Yeah. For the people that have never been to Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh is a great city, but the best hidden secret is in the basement of this building. It truly is, and I'll let you guys figure that out. Like, because every time I come here, we end up in the basement. That's right, and that's that's where the good stuff happens. <laughs> and the play, yeah, the players come here, have a good time. Um, but yeah, it, it, yeah, thank you for the plug. We, I'm gonna start a, a podcast. I, I, that, that's why I have to because of these type of stories that they take a lot of time because of the details of how awesome, especially how Puerto Ricans tell stories. We can't just oh, be like, this no, is what happened. You have, we to have to build go it up. It. You gotta, yeah, you gotta. My mother, my, see, this is my mother's fault because that's how she spoke. <laughs> yeah, Puerto Rican, of course. But, you know, the, the, all the guys that you mentioned, we used to go after the games and hang out. That's so I wild. used to go out with, you know, you don't understand why Derek Jeter, like going out, of, after, going out with Derek Jeter after the games to the clubs. I don't think you understand. The, the, just, it was amazing. It was we'll, we'll talk off off script. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it, it was just. I mean, I, I, I just said the respect I have for Derek, because Derek. Oh, by the way, his name, the Prince. That was his nickname, El Principe. Okay, because he was young. He was. It was just young. He was that. That was his second year. He's you know thirty. Uh, Ninety-seven was his what second uh, third year. Second, you know, he was young. Um, and I knew he was going to, I mean, special, very special. So Jorge Posada was my bat boy in Puerto Rico. <laughs> okay. What? Poor him. That's why I know. I, I know his father, his father, I, I played for his father in Puerto Rico. Bro, so like everything literally comes full yeah, circle. No, no. Yeah. So Jorge, I knew Jorge as a kid. I knew Jorge as a, so now I'm broadcasting and Jorge is the catcher for the team. Okay. So imagine that. You probably and had he, all kinds of nicknames. And he, for yeah, yeah, and, and his, and his, I, we did a commercial, and I knew that Jorge, you know, the big ears. <laughs> so, so I knew he had the ability of flapping his ears, like moving his ears. So I don't know if uh, if you even if ever saw the MSG commercial of of Jorge Posada moving his ears. I don't think I. I have. made him do that. <laughs> Anyway, but, oh, but I, listen, I, 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 I got commercials for Posada, for El Duque, <laughs> and all we did, we did commercials together. Like we, we built a marketing thing and, and I did some stuff with the players, but we used to hang out a lot. Um, it was like a tight knit little. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was, it was a great, I mean, I, I feel like I'm a. Uh, a go happen in there. I was talking to to um, a, a few of the players yesterday during training, and and they're looking at the ring because they're like, "Oh man, the ring." Wait, can I can I wear it for the, the rest of the show? Yeah, the ring. Oh, yeah, the ring. So they they uh, I said, "This is what what you guys should be playing for, right? The ring." I'm just gonna so, put this on camera. So like so um, I I tell them the story that I truly believe that somehow I'm like a good luck charm. Because when I'm around, it se- I seem to be around a lot of winning like teams. I'll give you an example. 1979. 79, we are family. People don't realize that I, that's those 78, 79 summers, I was here with the team every day, batting practice, checking fly balls, catching in the bullpen during the, during the games. Um... I would leave around the seventh inning 
to give out messages to girls, but that's a different <laughs> story. Um, but I, I was part of that team. I feel I was part of that team. But then in 1986, they, they, I was hanging out with all the Mets. It was my boys. I'm in New York. I'm hanging out with all the... So we, what happens in 86? Uh, we win the World Series. So I'm hanging out with Doc and Darrow. I mean, we... every. Um, that postseason, I was uh, traveling with Hank Aaron. It was an amazing summer. Uh, the, the postseason. But then... Um, Toronto Blue Jays when Joe Carter hit the home run to win the World Series I was actually hanging out with Robbie Alomar and the guys who were there and then I go to Houston and, oh I go to New York New York <laughs> I'm there and they're winning I so go to they Houston they were winning yeah so and then Yes Network comes so my last call was when Luis Gonzalez hit that Texas off of Mariano to win the World Series okay that was my last call for the Yankees. I kept on doing an ESPN, but that was my last call for the Yankees. Okay. That was 01 because the yes network came in 02 started in 02. Right. So MSG network, that was the last broadcast for them. Right. That year. 01. Okay. That was nine 11. Okay. They went into November, um, late because of nine 11. Um, so after that, the Yes Network came and they offered something ridiculous. I'm like, are you kidding me? I, do you want me to pay to go work? It, that's what you asked me to do. You asked me to go. I said, I said the Yes. I said no. I'm not. I'm not. I can't do that. So you said I, no to the Yes Network. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I said no to Yes. I said no to Yes. No to Yes. I said you're, you're. So I told my guys. I said if you we stand our solid ground. If you, I got you guys the rings. If you listen to me, okay, you'll be able to, we'll be able to do this together and we'll be able to be a force. They're going to have to bring us. But the other two guys, oh yeah, I'll take it. So they took us. I'm not saying, I said, no, I'm not going in. Absolutely not. No way. So that was it. So I go to Houston. I end up in Houston and I'm hanging out with these guys and then Houston takes off. So I, I'm just taking credit for all that success around us neighborhoods i've been hanging out i mean at. it's kind of a, it's it's a just saying I, I, i'm just saying what's, what's the word for it when something happens and people say it's like by mistake coincidence coincidence that's a lot of coincidence i know there's a lot of a them. lot of coincidences. A lot of coincidence so what you're saying is no, i'm just saying this episode's about to pop off yes because we're hanging out yeah look at uh, that about uh, just saying there are stories about me there's a guy in vegas when I, I was living in Vegas for for a minute, and the guy had a show, a little baby show like this, yeah. And met uh, met some guy in a batting cage and and talking. No, oh, I have a guy. Can he can do an, uh, 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 you know he wants to do an interview, whatever. Can you do it? I said, listen, I met the guy with the phone, like the guy. I said, okay, let's let's do it. And I did. I did. I did two shows. The rest is history for him. Then I do one more show. I had <laughs> I gotta I gotta I got listen, there's some I don't know, it's 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 like magic. It's it's good it's, it's just good it's, luck, man. It's, it's just, good energy. It's good energy, it's That's it's just it and it's goodwill, right? I, I mean the guy nobody knew the guy and it, it, why are you doing this guy's show? This guy's nobody. I said, Well what do you mean he's somebody? He is a person, he is someone who's actually is doing something, his passion, okay? Why am I, who am I to stop him from doing that? Dude, perfect saying. There's this, uh, there's this girl who's a fighter and she asked to be, on, she asked, she, she asked to pay to be on my show. Um, it was the craziest thing. I'm like, she's like, Hey, like I, I got a big fight coming up. Like how much do I have to pay to be on your show? I'm like, no, I don't, I don't know what other podcasts do. Like, yeah, yeah. no, I don't do it. She's like, well, I'm new. Like, I, I just want to get my name out there. I'm like, look, I'm I'm booked for March and but like after March, I'll yeah, I'll get you on. Like you don't have to pay. We'll meet, we'll, we'll find somewhere good, we'll do it. Like and she's like, Oh, like what do I have to bring? Like that I'm like Bring your mouth. Yeah, and like your, your mouth voice. And a good story. And, and like, yeah, bring your voice. Bring bring like, who you are. I'm the same way. Like I've I've heard, especially after diving into the podcast stuff, I've heard horror stories of like podcasts reaching out to people and be like, Oh, you, you know, for a thousand dollars you can you can jump on the show. I'm like 
What? I mean, I guess every, every podcast is yeah, a different niche no, I, or whatever. Listen, but now, I mean, everything is commercialized. Yeah, I'm like, but I, I, I'm hoping to make money off this. Yeah, no, but like you're, in, in you're different will. ways. Yeah, I'm like to me, it's like I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to sit across people, talk to people, learn people. Like, you know how much I've taken away from from talking with people. You can't put a money. No, you can't, you can't put a dollar price. on no, that. No, no, there's no you price. Like I just had um, this guy Isaac Greeley owns the Math Factory. He, phenomenal coach, phenomenal wrestler. Dude, everyone talked about him. Everyone talked about. Him. I never met him before. I, I I got to sit across the, the the table with that dude, and and like, chat him up. Mm-hmm. Like you can't put a dollar amount on that. Our friendship, you can't put a dollar amount on that, dude. Every time we're dinner, I'm like talking to you. We're like, we're always talking about business ideas and like, we're always, that's how, like people probably get annoyed with us because we're like, oh, dude, we have to start oh, this. this. We have to start our, this. Have to, yeah, and they're like, yeah, well, oh, you know, go, you, you know, they they're always talking about yeah, us. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Uh, but like you can't put money on that right like so oh that was a lot that was a lot i'm excited um what uh what advice do you have for people who are striving to make a meaningful impact in their communities but they're just like they're doubting themselves or like like kind of like you had that self doubt in the in the initial like what what advice would you give to people trying to like be, be meaningful, be impactful, but they, they there's that voice in their head of like, I'm not good enough or I'm not big enough or I'm not impactful enough. Like, is there any advice you can give? Uh, that? Yeah, you are impactful. You can impact a person's life by just smiling. When you walk the streets, don't frown. Look at people in the eye, nod, acknowledge them, and a smile. That in itself can change a person's life that day. Dude, that's that's so true. Like little things. People want to do you don't big have, things. Listen, it's very simple. You are now impacting people. You're making an impact, and that is contagious. And what that does is actually that's a chain reaction that you have no idea how you're impacting how many people by that smile. So when you tell me that you don't know how to impact people, start right there. Start with the small stuff. Simple. Yeah. But then also my my suggestion is to find your passion because once you find your passion, you're you're free, you're you're I mean, you're flowing, right? You're not forcing yourself to be there. Now you can actually have fun. Right. You can be yourself. You're, you're, you're be yourself. You're a different air about you. But now you can affect everyone around you because you are on, in that vibration. That's so, yeah. People don't realize, like, if you don't even want to be there. Why? Like, why pe- well, that, that people can tell. Like, you give off a certain energy rather than, like, being in a place that you're one, like, you feel welcomed, right? If, you're, if you don't like what you're doing, you probably don't feel welcome there. You don't enjoy being there. You, you know, I, you can ask Kaylee. I think it was last year. I sat down and I said, you know, there are certain situations where <clears throat> people will go and, and they get in, you know, they, they don't feel right, right? And it's because you know, I said, you can't go when you're being tolerated. You need to go where you're being celebrated. Different vibration there. Night and day. Yeah, we often surround ourselves with people who just like have no good intention for us. And then you wonder why your life is the way it is or why you're in a bad mood. It's like change your environment. First off, change your environment. Surround yourself. What they what do they say? You become the five people you hang out with. Who are you hanging out with? And if you're not hanging out with anyone, find someone to hang out with. Network. Be, be, be what you need to do. Yeah, I mean, change. Nothing wrong with that. Different armor. Scary though. That change. People are like, ooh. People listen, don't like change. Man. Change. Listen, if if change would kill people, I would have been dead. That many times. I so many times, so many times. 
right? Reinventing. Man. But but the but you know what the best thing uh, is at least for me is the fact that all the knowledge that I have acquired in all the things that I've delved into, and I I'm I'm very curious, right? Because when I see something. I have to learn about. I need. I I have to. I I need to get to the bottom. Of it. Okay, I got that. Okay, and at some point in my life, I use it. It, it comes back, full circle because I, I took the time to learn about this, and later on, I'm able to connect and actually connect dots because that's what I do, right? And and that's why when you have a network and you start, you know, LinkedIn, for example. LinkedIn is a very good example, right? You have a network on LinkedIn, a, a network on Facebook. You, there's a network, just a community that if you press a button and you send a message, all these people are going to hear your voice. Okay. Power of social media now. Exactly. So I'm just giving you like some instances that we have to look at it like wait a second i have this and i built this how can i be of impact you can be of impact if you if you have five people in your network you can impact five people who can then impact five exactly who can then impact exactly exactly it's as simple as that you don't have to go big you don't have to go home just actually you have it there say good morning Look at it in the in. I don't know why it just popped in my head, but in the instance of baseball, what's what's the best hit someone can have? The best the hit. The best hit. A grand slam. A grand slam. Right. A right? grand salami. A grand salami. Take the the runners out. What is it? A solo. A home run. Yeah. It's the same move. Balls over the wall. One impacts you. Maybe the team, you get a point. Maybe it's a winning team. Maybe you're down. <laughs> the Grand Slam, you have three runners on. You're, right. You every get... single one of them are scoring. Correct. They're all winning as well as you. Put your team up. Now your team wins. It's a championship game. Your team goes, like, it, it's, it's the power of perception, right? It's the same move, the same right. play in a different environment. That's I don't know why I just thought of that, but it's like it, it just made sense. It clicked with me. It's like... Yeah, you, you impact these five people. Right. That might be a grand slam because who they impact or when it comes back to you, it's it's a huge win. Or you don't impact them. and But it's like you have the ability to impact everyone around you, even if it's one, two, three, four, five. Do you know how hard it is to be born? I mean, I've had some experience with it. <laughs> But what I'm trying, what I'm trying to get to, is the fact that we are here for a reason. All right, we are here. Dude, we I were beat called out like a million swimmers, man. We, yeah, we we were called to be here, and and you know, I know that I'm I'm here, and I'm here to help people. I mean, I'm here to to help to help people. Uh, my passion is to help people. My passion is technology. You know, I, I go into technology and I, and I need to learn more. I, I need any more information. I need, I need to, I need to be a, a guinea pig because if I'm going to talk about it, I want to be able to experience it. If it works, then I can help people because I have that information to help those in need. So I myself put myself into situations because I have to know, and I, I'm not going to say something that is going to hurt someone. If I don't, if I don't, if I didn't experience it myself, I'm not going to promote it. Now you've experienced the Relentless Project, so you got to promote it. Hey, uh, that was a plug. Uh -huh. what, uh, one thing I did want to hit on before we leave, uh, what are your future, what, what do you got planned for the future? I know, I'm not sure if you want to mention it or not. I'm not sure if it's been talked about, but the um, the documentary. The documentary. Out. Yeah. Ooh, yes. I, documentary. I, I had the privilege of sitting with you and watching it. I'm excited, but it, I can't speak on that because it was a closed environment. But um, what's what's the plan for that? Um, when is this airing now? Because this, this will be, I'll tell you right now, 
March 3rd. Today is March 3rd. <laughs> Sunday, March 3rd. March 3rd. So in about, in actually eight days, um, the dock will be a south by southwest. West. So two we'll days ago from today. From, from, from when this airs. So March 1st? No, no. The, ele- the 11th. Oh, oh, March 11th. Yeah, oh. in eight days. In, in eight, eight days. Yeah. Oh, we're talking live. Okay, yeah. in eight days, in March eight, 11th. In eight days, the documentary is going to premiere at South by Southwest. So the film festival. So we are stoked. Uh, we're excited. Um, Vinegar Hill did a fantastic job. David Lotrogi, um, the producer, um, did, did the, the, the man, um, he, uh, directed this. Un- unbelievable. Good job. I mean, I didn't even get to see the finished product, but what I saw was like, it's phenomenal. I mean, they they did an amazing job capturing what I know. And then there was things, I thought I knew a lot. And there was things that I was learning. And I'm like, looking at you, I'm looking at it. I'm like, what? Like, so I think, I think, I think they did an amazing job. I, I, can't, I can't speak, you know, for the family, but I think it's going to be huge. And, and, and peeling that layer. There's the, 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 his story has so many layers that, you know, that in itself kind of has one that a lot of people didn't know about, some, some of them, but um, the story has so much that you can pick and take a thread and do a whole project on one of these arteries, if you will. And I think that's the beauty of like life, right? We were talking about earlier how people have this perception of someone. We all have so many threads. And if you pull on that thread. There's a storyline. Story that that's why I have so many movies that I have to make because are I you, got so many stories. I all jokes to, aside, are I, you going to make no, a book? Uh, yeah, I, I have to. But but I, I the more I think about it, I know that I have the content to become an amazing freaking crazy producer because just my life alone, I take those threads and these are amazing freaking movies because you, if you, you can't write the shit up, you can't, I mean, you can't, a writer has to be, have that create creativity of what? No, I, this thing's real. And was, I got, I got, and I got, and I got receipts. Yeah. There was a story you told me of a band Oh yeah, that came to your house. Yeah, yeah. No, yep. no, no, not that came in, that you brought to your oh, house. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was like the middle of the night or something. No, but I disappeared. You need to understand. I disappeared. You disappeared. For, yeah. yeah, as a as like a young man, young kid. Yeah, dude, that alone is a movie story. Yeah, like you were telling me this, I'm like, I can see that in theaters. Like, yeah, I can see and, that. But and that was only that was only five days of my life. Okay, so so I have trips, for example, that from the beginning of the trip to the end of the trip is a freaking movie, like it's a movie. The stuff that happened, it, 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 it's I don't think it, it's Forrest Gump has nothing on me. Yeah, we need to uh, we need to get a book out, and we need to get a movie out. And before we end this, how would you define success? Because everyone's looking for it, right? Everyone wants success. Everyone's in search for success. Everyone's striving for it. What is what is what would you define success as? I think I, I already touched on it, and because it's it's finding your passion. Because if you if you're not ha- if you if you're not happy um, with what you with what you're doing in your skin right now. Um, success is being able to be happy, to be, to be, to be oneness. Okay. Um, it's not about physical uh, things. Uh, I believe being able to have, um, a legacy to when people think about you, 
actually, they actually smile, right? You have touched someone, you have impacted someone. Success is being able to actually see someone get out of a hole of a situation. Um, there's so many elements that come into what a full blown success meaning for an individual. Um, everyone has their own space. Cubby hole, if you will, of what that means. But everyone should have those elements inside that ball of wax that is called success because it's not just one thing that you can do. It's so many things that will mesh together, okay, because it's a balance, right? So if you're not happy with your life or your work life, everything else is going to be affected, right? So how you can't measure what success is if you are unbalanced in some other elements and other phases that will become your wholeness, your oneness. So yeah, success is not final. No. We're always... And, and, and success can be actually your own journey, still in the journey. You have success in your journey. Everything that you are looking at, you need to look with a lens of success. We're looking at the positive, okay, and changing our mindset instead of focusing on the, on the negative and something that I do sometimes and I have to... Kaylee has to remind me sometimes um, in, in, in actually the way that you look at things, right? You're like, okay, well, this happened, but why did it happen? And looking at the positive, why that's how the reinvention occurs, because there is a reason why that thing happened that will change the direction that you need to go, but you need to trust that it is what it is because you're supposed to be there. This needed to happen. If you have that mindset that this is happening for a good reason, everything negative that's happening is for a positive reason. Okay. That's why you need to change because it's how you need to take a look at it. This thing happened because it was not meant to be, because something else better is going to occur. Or this sets you up for that. Exactly. It, 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 because it, it's, not co it's, not, it's not a coincidence. Okay? Success is not f final, and failure is not fatal. Look at that. T-shirt. I need to put that on a T-shirt. T-shirt, brother. Because like a lot of times we would see a failure as this didn't work. Okay, maybe it didn't. Maybe this set you up for this over here. For example, baseball didn't work for you. Well, playing baseball. But it set you up for an amazing broadcasting career. Because if you would have never played, That's an you, would, you wouldn't have had the right the street cred, in a way, to, to do that. You know, to, to, to broadcast and be but able listen, to put on yourself the, in On there. the speaking, for example, I mean... The motivational speaking side, okay, my time as a manager, all right, as a manager, manage, that first team that I had to manage, right, we went to the championship game. I didn't, I didn't tell you that part, but I didn't tell you the part that that Thursday when I inherited that team, they had a baseball game scheduled for that next Saturday. And I said, these guys are not ready for against professionals because my buddy set it up, right? At least as a professional, all the, prof all the professionals are buddies, right? So he set up a game with this 16 to 18 year olds with the professional guys on Saturday. We're playing and the, the grad, anyway, long story short, my first baseman hits this guy in the stands. He's in the stands hitting this guy Saturday. This is two days after I took over. I don't know the scouts from Adam. I don't know. They don't even know their names yet. So I hear chanting two uh, innings later. I hear chanting coming from the projects behind the ballpark. And I look up and I see at least a couple hundred people 
coming with sticks, guns, chains towards my players. They're coming up the street because I know they're coming. I knew what was happening. They're coming after my first baseman. So when we see this, I see my players running to their cars and coming back towards the field all carrying guns. And I'm like, what is going on? Right? So in the middle of a game. Yeah. It was an exhibition game, but still yeah. Still. But yeah, it's a baseball game. Right? Even even an uh, exhibition game, practice. And uh so I I grabbed the, the equipment bag, I emptied it out, I said, I want all the guns in here now. So I made them put all the guns into the duffel bag. Everyone to center field, as far to the right field, to, to the field, to get away from the entrance where the guys were coming to. So we all went to the field, and I'm waiting to see what's going to happen. So I see this guy coming in with a guy, with a kid that my first baseman beat up. And he's coming, he comes into the field, so I go and meet him halfway. And he goes, this is not with you, give me the guy that beat my brother up. And I said, listen, I'm sorry, can we talk about this? And you know, and he said, hold on. He looked at me. Are you Clemente? I was shaking because I was like, you know, this is like. Yeah, it's a big, yeah, some shit's about to go. So, so I said, yeah. He goes, oh, that's like, wow. He goes, like, he was like, everything, his demeanor changed, right? His demeanor changed. I said, listen, you know, I'm sorry what, what, what happened, but you can't touch these guys, you know, you got to come through me, number one. Let's, let's kind of make a deal here. I know this is your brother. Let's, uh, let's do something. Um, he can become my, he'll be my assistant in the team. And uh, keep him out of harm's way and whatever you're doing, he, he can be safe with me on this side. And, you know, and he goes, you know, I would like that. So I took him under my wing, and he became part of my team, his brother. Everything was cool after that. But then I needed to t turn over to my guys and ask them, why are you carrying guns? I found out I had car thieves, hitmen, drug dealers. 17 out of the 18 guys were in criminal activities. But uh, as the weeks went on, um, we became a team. We became a team. We did things together. Um, it, they needed the direction. And, you know, after the season was over, we, we get to the championship game, we lost. But they became good, good players. We became better people. Only two of those got in trouble after I got done with them. The rest are doing fantastic. Bro, that's a story in and of itself. Like, growing up, you know, humble beginnings, we didn't have, like, sports, really. We didn't have any, like, we didn't have something to distract us from the street. So we gravitate to, you know, stuff I can't mention on this podcast. But it's a, it's a perfect testament of someone who, who comes in with good intention, because you could have easily been like, I didn't sign up for this shit. And it, let's say everyone says you're, you said people say you're entitled or spoiled. You could have went in there with, I'm fucking Roberto Clemente, okay? I don't need this shit. You fucking, you stuck in there. You molded these kids who God knows where they would be if you would have just quit on them. They've probably been quit on their whole life, you know? And it, some people aren't cut out to, to deal with that. Some people who've been through stuff, who experience things, are better equipped to deal with this. All this to say, like, I wouldn't change my childhood for anything. I didn't have the best childhood. I didn't have the worst childhood. There's people who have it worse than me. But I grew up with a mom who always put her best foot forward, gave up food so we can eat. Worked three jobs so I can have new clothes, new shoes. Wasn't name brand. I was rocking the shacks when people were rocking Jordans, but they were new to me. 
you know, but everything I've experienced in life has put me in a place where when I get hosed or when I get like the short end of the stick, I'm like, it's cool. It's all right. I'll be all right. Life can be worse. I'm blessed right now. And it's put me in that position. So all that to say, I think we've, we've been experienced things to propel us forward. I think your manager said you got to go. Yeah. No, but uh, I, appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you for jumping on, brother. I'm, it means the world to me. Um, we're here at the Clemente Museum, you know, surrounded by a bunch of memorabilia. and, and Oh, and you're going to cool see stuff. a lot more of this place. When you launch your podcast. And it'll be, I'll announce it on here before it gets launched. And I'm excited for what's to come, brother. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, my pleasure, brother. All right. Later. All right.